I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. Yeah, I like to move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. Yeah, I like to move it. The movement phase isn't about knowing where you want to move. It's about understanding why you need to be there. That's a big difference. So I'm going to try to help you tunnel vision less. And we're going to go over the basics of movement from holding objectives to properly using cover, uh, how to make sure your army is staying hidden, flanking your opponents, ways you control people with fly keyword, and most importantly, threat ranges and denial zones. All right, let's move it. So in this example, this is what deployment should look like. So we have an Eldar army here that is fighting the Tau. Where are the Tau? You can't see him. That's because he's deployed well. So when the game starts, the way they've kind of balanced first turn and second turn is generally with the train rules, the person that goes first is not going to have a lot of shots. So the Rangers have pre-deployed up further just to be able to pressure these objectives. And we can see the Tau army over here. So now the Tau, the Tau have massive respect for their Eldar and they know that they also need to remain hidden. So the crude have used their movement to get up behind this wall and over here. Now, the other thing to notice is that with most armies, especially more elite armies, they do not need to control every objective in order to win the game. To win on the primary, you need to make sure that you're holding three objectives, one, two, and three. On this specific map, the middle objective is worth bonus points. So what a good plan for the Tau player to do is to feed these crude in slowly to try to gain OPSEC. He can even move these to the left if need be. But you can see he's going hard on, uh, hard on this objective and this objective. Whereas the Eldar player is a little bit more split up. It definitely has his power focused on the opposite too. So the if you can grab that objective to kind of screw up your opponent's scoring, great. But you really do need to focus your deployment and your first movements on these initial three objectives, one being just your home objective. So this is after the Tau has taken their first movement phase. So the Tau player had a very interesting decision to make and that was to show or not to show. The uh, best course of action here is to basically just play KG. You know, three crew sent to the middle. So if these do get shot at, he could pull off the middle to stop them from being shot at. The most things just stayed where they were. The even long strike didn't come out at all. He has nothing to shoot at. So these did advance to get behind that wall. There's very little angles that they can be shot at now. So if they do get hit, it shouldn't be too hard. But the tower basically setting the trap and they know that there's nothing more dangerous than senior drivers. And there's a lot of Eldar tanks in the other side of those walls. And as well as this crew unit, just getting one guy on the objective. So they could have gone much further and they could have been all the way up forward but that would just make it easier for the Eldar to remove them. So they're trying to bring the Eldar into their guns. And that way, next turn, when the, if the Eldar take these baits, which they're probably going to have to, they'll have to reveal a lot of their army. And that's when these all these hidden towers are able to move out and just shoot at whatever they want before they're shot at in return. So the main point here is, as you can see, the Eldar have very few targets that they can really shoot at that they can do a lot of damage to or focus fire down on. Now, even in deployment, if any time you show a unit, even if you just show one unit, well, if only one unit showing, you can expect your entire enemy's firepower to go into that one unit because it's the only thing they can shoot. The uh, When you reveal things, either you're going to reveal a majority of your army or you're going to just reveal so little that your opponent can't really do a lot. And that gives you the terms of engagement and you get to choose where the fight happens and how it happens and with what, with, with what units. So just like how women deny you in real life, you can deny players in Warhammer. So this is the end of the first turn. We have Dark Eldar versus Orcs. So the Orcs are pretty well hidden, but did lose a scrap jet to the airplane. So what the Dark Eldar player did here is he's creating a giant denial zone. He's these. This is a weird map where there's just two objectives in the middle and they're very, very spaced out. So instead of moving everything up forward, he actually took out the incubi from the raider sent an empty raider up made sure that it faced backwards so we can wiggle his ass at him and taunt him but the uh these incubi are creating a gigantic bubble of denial 
So when you move, you always got to make sure you you can ask your opponent, like, what's the movement of that model? So Incubi can advance and charge. So they're a little different, but they move seven. Whatever their movement is, add 10 to that. So 17. Normally, if they can't advance and charge. You're going to want to say 17 inches away from things that you don't want to be charged by. So if, for example, the Incubi couldn't advance and charge here, the uh, depends on if they get the Vite up. They are basically telling the Orc player, don't go anywhere near that mid objective. Whatever you put there is going to die. Because no matter what it is, unless it's like Gazcall himself who can't die in one turn, even a uh, squig, uh, squig boss that moves up here is going to get charged by 10 Incubi and Drazhar. Drazhar alone will just kill anything. And that's the other problem is you can't oversaturate that either. So moving all these Mega Knobs up plus the Squig boss, there's a good chance that Drazhar will pick up the Squig boss and the Incubi will pick up all the Mega Knobs. And that can be game right there. So he's controlling this objective with these Incubi without actually even having them on there. So if he can even get them up to another spot, oops, that zoomed out weird, uh, to say right here, you know, he can actually pressure all three objectives with a charge from those Incubi. And that's a bad place for the opponent to be in. And this is part of what makes Dark Eldar so strong. On this other side, you can see the same thing. There's a succubus that's hiding right behind this Venom. And the Venom's full of a bunch of Urgles and an Archon. So this is almost pressuring the back objective. But he, if he goes a little bit further, he can easily pressure all of them. And it's same thing. Like, that's not Lilith. It's just a succubus. But the succubus is going to pick up anything. If you've ever fought one of those things, they just delete shit. And for just extra assurance, there's a raider here full of witches. And they're just waiting. Just staring down whatever comes down that way. Just with their resting witch face waiting for anything that they can charge they could make it to anywhere on the map that they wanted to and they're not very dangerous so they're probably the most expendable thing that the dark eldar player has right now so using that to pressure with these giant denial zones so the denial zones are everything when you get charged and you get killed especially by like dark Eldar, you walk into it most of the time you want to be the person charging so sometimes that means not even going for a lot of objectives first turn let your opponent have primary just make sure you're the one dictating the game, making the charges. Dark Eldar do this very, very, very well. Any type of fast-moving unit can, that's melee can create a very large denial zone. And set those up. Look for them on the map pregame when you're deploying. Be like, oh, if I can get my you know, these Mega Knobs, if they could get hidden, even just three of them sitting right here behind this skull thing. Like, that's a huge bubble. Five inches plus ten inches, and orcs can advance and charge during WA. So the uh, that's a big area of denial. Fast-ranged units, on the other hand, things like these squig buggies and the scrap jets, these are things that they move fast too, but their area of denial is almost in a straight line. So you're basically using these fast units to get really good fire in arcs where you can see a long ways away in different directions. Um, trying to cover as much of the field as possible with your guns. Um, usually opponents are going to shoot the thing that's coming right at them. So when you really rush in with things, generally your ranged units are a little bit more safe, especially in an orc situation because their ranged units aren't super oppressive compared to what's charging at them. Um, that keeps a lot of damage off of them. And same thing with stuff that takes few wounds, like Gaskal's going to hide. Like he, can, he needs to be alive towards the late game. The less things that are on the battlefield to do his chunks of wounds the easier it's going to be him for him to just be a bully on the battlefield and deal with whatever is happening in the game a counter play that the orc player does is he can create this is a rot mega tank so if he can get this thing up he can turn it sideways and he has a lot seven there's seven mega or seven heavy flamers on this so that can create a giant don't charge me thing especially for elves elves do not like flamers so if you do have units that have flamethrowers that is a way that you can counter denial zones a lot of time or any unit that just overwatches very very well a lot of the units in this game that delete things quickly aren't exactly good at receiving punishment so to recap on this tip watch enemy threat ranges and create your own denial zones movement plus 10 that's how far you need to stay away or try to get people to walk into You guys want to see a funny way you control Grey Knights? So Grey Knights' favorite unit, their little incestor things, they don't 
actually fly. They fall with style. So if you have shooty fly units and there's ruins or any type of thing to stand up on, Grey Knights and other melee heavy army, they hate it when you go up too high for them to charge. So especially things like this Doomsday Arc, the, uh, as you can see, there's Scepter dudes right here, or whatever the hell they're called. They, they're just not going to be able to get to that Doomsday Arc, and I can just free shoot. So I have Storm Bolters and a Nemesis Dreadnought coming back in on me. The lot of units have fly, and that's the biggest thing that separates something like an attack bike from a land speeder. So attack bike is, in my opinion, better, but a land speeder can go up. You can fly right on top of just your mostly standard ruin, and you definitely can't do that with an attack bike. Hey, do you guys know why Necrons are such trolls in the lore? It's because their motherboard never loved them as a child. Oh, come on. I told that like a goss. So, here's a bonus tip. If you guys aren't aware, they've done studies and shown that if you subscribe to my channel, you will just roll more sixes. Something to do with good karma? I don't know, just trust me, it works. So here's an example of a really dumb Necron player on his quest to find Sarakana. So there are a lot of things going wrong with this first movement phase of the Necron player. Obviously what he's thinking is uh, he wants both of these objectives, the one on the left here and the one on the right, and he thinks he's immortal. So let me show you what's going to happen the following turn. So these Repentia are about to decimate everything, and it's going to go even worse for the Necron player than he would than just losing the Scorpec Guard. The first unit of Sisters only needs a 5-inch charge to just get right in there, and that gets bodies on the objective and gets them on that side of the Scorpec. Now the other big mistake the Necron player did is by these Sisters charging, if they just roll a 6, this Sister actually goes 6 inches this way to get behind right over here. She doesn't have to go towards the thing she charged. She just, her one model has to go into combat with what was charged. And the rest move in is shown. Then what's going to happen is during the pile-in, this Repentia right here, she's closest to this heavy destroyer that doesn't really want to be com in combat and for some reason thought he was safe there. She's going to pile in into this destroyer. She cannot attack that destroyer. So then during combat, these first sisters are going to pick up a lot of these destroyers. They might not get them all, and that, that's totally fine. So these Repentia were then able to pile into the heavy destroyer, and now they're protected from shooting unless the heavy destroyer falls back next turn. Now these Repentia have piled into the destroyer, so they can't be shot at unless this destroyer falls back. The Necron player then has to decide if he wants to spend 2 CP on the, still the first round of the battle where CP is probably the most precious in interrupt here with only two of his guys left, if he has any guys left. Say for example he does not want to interrupt, he will lose these score packs, but during the pile-in, these this girl would be able to pile in 3 inches towards this leader and then finally consolidate into him. So now this guy will have to fall back if these sisters want to be shot at. And they've completely taken this objective. But you know what? At least the Necron player's got scarabs on the middle. So now this Necron player has rewound time and he's moved a little bit more intelligently. So instead of the scarabs going for the middle, he needs these Repentia dead. So now the Repentia have a big decision to make. He's screened them out. And one thing to be careful of with units on small bases like Repentia, you don't even want them to be able to squeeze through that little gap in the middle, the because uh, they will do that. But by making this screen, the Repentia are almost forced to go in, and most likely he's going to send in at least one of them. If the Sisters player isn't using his head, he might send in both of them, and that would mean that he's going to lose this fight and this whole flank. So when he charges in, like most likely he will pick up all these scarabs, but that's fine. If we look at the objective, which we can see that the Scorpec Destroyer is still on it, and most Necron units are OPSEC. So for this next example, we have a Deathwing army. We're a bunch of Terminators hiding in a ruin. We've got more Terminators hiding in a ruin with a Dark Shroud. And some attack bikes on the corner because, you know, 
That's so Ravenwing. But Tyranids have already taken their first turn, advancing on their position. So now what this Tyranid player is doing to take advantage of the slow-moving Deathwing is it's very common to want to put monsters, especially monsters that can be easily picked off, that they're lacking invuln save or have low wounds, dreadnoughts even. They are great as flanking units. Generally in 40k, when you send your army in, the uh, if you have distraction carn effects, so I'm using actual carn effects for this example, but the uh, by having this objective pretty well covered here in the center, this screamer killer can do all kinds of chaos by just pressuring the fact that he can go back there. He might not ever try to break into the enemy deployment and do anything unless there's ranged units back there, but he's forcing these, if you see him here, there's uh, eradicators hiding. These eradicators are gonna have to come out and shoot him. So they're probably gonna get a shot on something and they're all gonna have to shoot at one thing to get their double shots. So that's preventing them from like stepping out and shooting both of these he can only deal with one he's gonna give it up he's pretty much assuming that carnifex is dead but it's temporarily giving the eradicator something to do same with this flank where these attack bikes pretty much have to come up and like the carnifex during his turn gets to shoot at these attack bikes but the uh most if he doesn't kill one he might kill one they're gonna absolutely end him afterwards but by having to go after him, he's the Tyranids are preventing the attack bikes from really going into the meat of the army. But when you deploy, flank with your distraction Carnifex unit. So whatever you have that's just scary, low points, even if it's like a Furioso Dreadnought or something, then the meat and potatoes of your army generally wants to go towards the center. So as you can see, there's three squads of Tyranid warriors pushing the center, and a lot of them are under a Venom Throw. So the... Ranged units, however, like those you're just going to find good firing points. So, for example, this Hive Tyrant has the Shard Gullet Relic, so he's very powerful in shooting. He's just looking, he's probably going to sit here most of the game. Like, that way he can run to this objective or this objective if it needs help. But he just wants to fire that gun as long as he can and try to create angles where not a lot of things can see him. Things are going to have to stand over here to shoot him. And he can move either this way too to get angles over to the other side. But as you can see, the Tyranid player still preferring to hide, but knows that he's showing pretty much his whole army. So everything is pretty much come out that he's okay with losing. Things like this Hive Tyrant with the Shard Gullet doesn't have a good enough shot to even risk showing itself right now. It's better to just wait a turn, hide. That way there's no way attack bikes are going to swing around super, super fast and just nuke them. And like we mentioned before, this Hive Tyrant is setting up for a giant area denial zone. So he doesn't even care about getting into combat. He's doing his job just by being in this spot. Any Anything that tries to go for this is going to have problems dealing with him. And with the Reaper of Obliterax, he does mortal wounds. He's great at countering those Terminators. Also, like in the last example, if you check the distance between the Terminators and these guys, it's about 16 away, which is 10 plus their 6-inch movement. So it's highly unlikely that these Deathwing Knights hiding behind this ruin are going to get a charge on these warriors. The main pressure of this point, though, is the distraction Carnifex. Especially on this flank, there's going to be a constant harassment of monsters coming around this corner to get multiple charges. Because what can happen a lot of times to armies, especially like Tyranids, if a small unit gets in here, all of a sudden Carnifex can start blocking themselves and preventing other charges from getting in. The, uh, this is one of the only times, though, that I it's okay to not fight on the point. If this was more infantry heavy, this guy should not be here. He should be assisting this objective right here. But simply by existing and the way the map is, because this is a crazy looking map, the uh, he's just going to get in the way if he's on that side. He's a screamer killer. He has no guns, so he's just going to advance until he can charge. So for this next example, I'm going to use the same army we were just looking at. So with this Deathwing, how they can respond to these all these Tyranids right in their face. So like I mentioned, the, the Deathwing are just going to give up that left objective. There's, there's nothing for them there. There's too many bugs. 
So what they've done is they've formed a wall with the weaker Terminators because these Deathwing Knights are going to come in handy a lot with how many monsters there are here. So the regular uh, Relic Terminators, they have formed a wall to protect these Deathwing Knights. So they could have gone farther. They all advanced. So I just assume they all rolled a three, which is slightly below average. But he was able to get his foot in the ruin and to use that as cover up here. There's three Terminators in the open and one stayed all the way back just to keep that cover. It shouldn't be the Sergeant. I made a mistake there, but you get the idea. So what's happening here is, yes, I could have gotten a lot more movement, but it is so, so important to keep your infantry in cover all the time. So I see all the, well, so many games where people will do their move and they'll have them just outside. And these guys will be up like this as they move forward. When, as you saw, that doesn't do any different than what I had, except I have a much better armor save bonus. I'll have to take the saves on them first. That's fine. I mean, the Terminator in cover, his defense goes up so much against almost every gun in the game. Even as a just-in-case, like two Deathwing Knights here are able to get behind this wall. And sadly, that's all they could get in cover. But two of them is a huge deal, especially with this Dark Shroud giving a minus one to hit. Tyranids are going to find that these things are going to be a pain in the ass to remove. So over here on the left, the Eradicators pretty much have to take the bait for the Screamer Killer because there's a Screamer Killer coming at them. The, uh, they did, could have gone farther than this because they want to make their way to the right, but it's just, it's too silly to come out of cover. There's too many guns that could be pointed to them, and they're going to be too valuable at killing these bugs. So they only moved a little bit, but managed to stay in cover to retain that armor save with that armor contempt because it's huge. Now over on the right flank is where things get a little bit more dicey. So the Dark Angel player is making a bet. He knows that he's not going to outscore primary, but he can at least get 10 points at the start of the next turn. So by advancing one of the Terminators straight up, he's able to get him onto the objective. And then he has the rest of them, as many as he can, are just in cover to get that cover bonus. The uh, What he's relying on doing is he's got just two little combi plasma and plasma firstborn marines and the Talon Master need to remove all three of these warriors. To help ensure that, the attack bikes had to book it to the left. Only one attack bike was able to get in range of the warriors. The other two attack bikes, though, can easily shoot this. Well, not easily, just barely shoot this Carnifex. So if they succeed in removing these Tyranids off this mid-objective, it's not the best scenario still because the Tyranid player will still score one objective, two objectives, three objectives. But if these Deathwing can survive, That'll at least give the Dark Angel player one objective, two objective, giving him eight on his primary. Holding these Terminators back would risk losing that and just getting a four on primary, which can be really hard to come back from. Overall, for this Deathwing player, the next turn is going to hurt really, really bad. But the fact that the Deathwing Knights are so protected, whatever goes in on these Terminators is going to have to deal with them next. And the only way that that is going to happen is by using cover. So the fact that these Deathwing are, so many of them have moved kind of weird and not just as fast as they could go to where they're trying to get to. They are, a lot of them are in cover and that's going to mean a lot more are going to survive. That's the only way that this Deathwing army can win right now is by ultimate defense on this first, this next coming turn. Thanks so much for watching. I'm really trying to hit a thousand subscribers. So if you guys could, if you like this video, please subscribe. I really want to do a part two where I go over the shooting phase as well as a part three where I go over the make the combat phase. I really, really could use your support. I have a Patreon page now where I will give you one-on-one -on -one coaching anytime you need. I'll even teach you how to, how to use Tabletop Simulator. Otherwise, my Discord will be linked below in the description. If you have any questions about your army, anything 40K related, feel free to message me. I'll see you guys in the next video.